What's up, everybody? This is Albert, pronouns he, him, his, and we're back with another um, edition of the Raisin Souls um, reading list. And for this um, video, we're going to be talking about James H. Cone's um, Black Theology and Black Power. For those of y'all who don't know who James H. Cone is, um, the notable... Um, um, black preacher that practices um, liberation theology. So um, he uses um, his his um, theological um, practice in church and um, in academic circles to focus on um, um, oppressed groups. And for black theology, he practice he practices black liber liberation theology, which focuses on. Um, the oppression that black people um, go through. So he's a social justice. He has a social justice lens to it. And um, he, yeah, he, if y'all if ever heard of Jeremiah Wright, um, Reverend Jeremiah Wright in um, Chicago, um, he practices black liberation theology, but also there's a womanist theology which gives um, a black woman centered um, theological lens. And I do have a book that will um, tackle that. Um, but um, we're going to talk about um, James Cone right now. So, um, yeah, let's get into it. So, um, the... So black theology and black power pretty much came up came from when um Malcolm X notably um said that Christianity is a white man's religion so that's how he that's how he um got into like the nation of Islam and has a muslim perspective um to um liberation but um James Cone um he um he he made room for like a Christian um perspective of on how we can um have a social justice while having um the principles of um by the gospel of Christ and stuff like that. So let's get into it. So we're gonna start off with the um, the introduction. So the introduction um, talks about um, the black power in the theological sense. So the black power movement, notably in the 70s, that the that you can know from black nationalist um, groups and um, from the Black Panther parties that um, pr that promoted um, this um, principle um, and pretty much. And James Cone pretty much tried to um, define um, black power with a the theological um, twist to it. And um, he, and, um, and you know, like how Black Lives Matter um, today is kind of it's kind of, it can be co-opted into like all lives matter. So pretty much negating um, the experiences that in the, of the injustice that is done to black people. It's the same way that happened with um, black power and, and um, it's kind of, and it's kind of, and people get this idea, like it's trying to promote um, black supremacy or um, reverse racism in which, which if we define racism, it's like Audre Lorde said, it's this um, framework in which there's an inferior and a superior group. And, there, and the superior group has all these institutional structures that make up into the position that they're in. So say what you want, but black people can't be racist. I don't know why people... Like you understand the experiences and the the madness that's going on into black communities, and that's not how race and that that's racism in itself. But there's no such thing as um, a black person that can be racist because there's no system or power um, structure that makes them into that puts them in a superior position and there's no way they can be in a dominant um position in the basis of race so that's that's that on that and i'm just trying to get to the introduction and here we go so um he um, quoted um Kenneth B Clark and 
Kenneth B. Clark says, moral issues are at stake. Non-involvement and non-commitment and the exclusion of feeling are neither sophisticated nor objective, but naive and violative of the scientific spirit at its best. When human fe feelings are part of the evidence, they cannot be ignored. Where anger is the appropriate response to exclude the recognition and acceptance of anger and even to avoid the feeling itself as if it were an inevitable co contamination is to set boundaries upon truth itself. If a scholar who studied Nazi concentration camps do not feel revolted by the evidence, no one would say he was objective, unobjective, but rather fear for his sanity and moral sensitivity. Feeling may twist judgment, but the lack of it may twist it even more. So um, he quoted um, Kenneth B. Clark when, when, um, when um, white people have this um, complaint that black people are just hell angry all the time. Y'all are ne you Negroes are never satisfied. Like this is uh, this is post civil rights and and um, post slavery. Well, post oh, quote unquote. Um, shadow slavery and um it's like okay we make we got y'all free from slavery we um took away jim crow and why y'all why y'all still mad but it's it's like people still died and people never got reparations from slavery people people are still are still segregated like all of the the conditions that were set in place because of um slavery and jim crow whether it's trauma whether it's um how communities are um set in different places whether it's um police violence whether it's state violence whether it's the access to health care whether it's employment those conditions that were set in place because of um, slavery and jim crow are still alive like we still got housing discrimination there's um sexual violence there's medical and violent medical violence and um all, like all of these are still set in stone like the ku klux klan is still around like it's like there's still some rage that needs to be put in order for the system to be it's, for the system to change fundamentally so that's kind of that's pretty much Cone giving um, justification on why people have a right to be mad. And um, J um, Cone also um, had a critique of um, black the black um, um, church and how it's been um, kind of pretty much enabling white supremacist ideologies. So he... Um, He's uh, against um, respectability politics in the church. And um, he also calls the United States the, um, the devil. So so this is how he practices his, the his theology. He sees, he sees like the United States, who, which is a product of capitalism and colonialism and exploitation. Literally, slavery... Um, made the United States what it is as anti the Antichrist. Like, the the way the United... Like, he's pretty much saying, like, the United S States is the Antichrist. It's literally the devil. So that's what um, a lot of um, Black liberation um, theologians... That's what... That's, this is the type of message that they preach. Um, like, Jeremiah Wright, I know he... He, he said... He, I think he literally said, America is going to go to hell. And, um, if, if y'all know, um, this is, um, if y'all know about, um, Ob Obama, he used to, he used to attend Jeremiah Wright's services, but because of, um, Jeremiah Wright's, um, his, um, philosophy is not looking good if Obama runs for president of the United States. So Obama pretty much kind of um, threw him under the rug so um he pretty much disrespected um Jeremiah Wrights because um you know you have you have to do you have to have this sort of image when you run for president and so so saying that so saying uh, going to services for and uh, attending services for someone that says America's going to go to hell is going to uh, 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 it's going to be an interesting campaign <laughs> but so um yeah, that's and that's the the introduction. So um, 
Chapter one is titled Toward a Constructive Definition of Black Power. So he was getting into more about what black power is. And black power, it's um, black people saying yes to humanity and no to oppression, which is white supremacy. So like pretty much what Black Lives Matter is supposed to um, um is supposed to impl implicate. He's, he said, um, it means complete emancipation of black people from white oppression by whatever means black people deem necessary. And he includes that if it's violence, like go, go get, do, go do violence. Cause those are, those are what, um, spread um that's literally christ itself if you're fighting for freedom you have to do whatever it takes to fight for freedom so that's what um that's his messaging and um he he also say um to say no means that the oppressor has overstepped his bounds and that there is a limit beyond which he shall not go it means that oppression can be endured no longer in the style that the oppressor takes for granted. To say no is to reject categorically the humiliating orders of the master. And by doing so, and by so doing to affirm that something which is placed above everything else, including life itself. To say no means that death is preferable to life. If the latter is devoid of freedom, better to die on one's feet than to live on one's knees. So it's better to pretty much make the sacrifice for freedom than to give yourself away and give yourself away for the sake of oppression. And um, that that's pretty much what how he um, got from the, from when the Black Power slogan was going around and. And I think that makes sense, like what it makes sense to what um, Black Power people are trying to um, um, promote. And um, he said it's a it's a, also um, an act of rebellion. So also um, saying like this is another war for freedom. So compared it to like the slave revolts, um, like Nat Turner's um, um, slave revolts and um saying that these rebellions are assertions and affirmations of being. So it's um it's um knowing that you recognize your humanity even when society tells you that you're not worthy. So it's um it's pretty much um what um Cone was um that that pretty much inspired Cone to um make this book. He said, black power in short is an attitude, an inward affirmation of the essential worth of blackness. It means that the black man will not be poisoned by the stereotypes that others have of him, but will affirm from the death of his soul. Get used to me. I am not getting used by, used to anyone. And if the white man challenges my humanity, I will impose my whole weight as a man on his life and show him that I am not that show good eaten that he persists in imagining. This is black power, the power of the black man to say yes to his own black being and to make the other accept him or be prepared for a struggle. So this is this is pretty this is um and yet yes, it's um it's a uh, man centered with this, but um you can look at it universally in a black experience, whether you're queer or whether you're a woman or whether you're disabled or anything. And um it's yeah, it's not, it's like not letting the society let the reality um define who you are. You have to define yourself with, within your identity and get a sense of um a community with people who also identify with those um principles. And um he also has um he also talked about an existential absurdity so, which is the United States, the this existential absurdity, whether it's the Constitution, whether it's the Declaration of Independence, whether it's the Lincoln Emancipation, and so he's talking about seeing within yourself versus seeing with with um, within America. So, thinking about Declaration of Independence, what does what does um, all man created equal mean for for people that created by people that are slave owners themselves? Um, what does the Lincoln emancipation, 
what are the intentions behind Lincoln creating the emancipation is because of the civil the civil war like the war has just got so messy that Lincoln said that he has to save the union by freeing the slaves that's why he freed the slaves it's not for um uh moral reasons it's for economic and um capitalist uh, motives so that's that's um pretty much where um the existential absurdity that um black people have to go through like what 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 kind what is the messages that we get from our history classes regarding um um black american identity and um and um yeah i think that was it he also challenged um what i said um about black people can't be racist about black people um yeah, black people can't be racist because we don't have the conditions to to promote race to promote black supremacy, whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, he he said absurdity arises as the black man seeks to understand his place in the white world. Like white supremacy is not just um, white people um saying just saying the n-word it's literally um what's fulfilling um what are your taxes going to who controls the government who controls the means of production so and that's white people and um and um when we get to um what black power means and is it a form of black racism um cone said when black power advocates refuse to listen to their would-be liberators they are charged with creating hatred among black people thus making significant personal relationship between blacks and whites impossible it should be obvious that the hate which black people feel toward whites is not due to their creation of the term black power Rather, it is a result of the deliberate and systematic ordering of society on the basis of racism, making black alienation not only possible, but inevitable. For over 300 years, black people have been enslaved by the tentacles of American white power, tentacles that warm, that worm their way into the guts of their being and invade the gray cells of their cortex. For 300 years, they have cried, waited, voted, marched, picketed, and boycotted, but whites still refuse to re recognize their humanity. In light of this, attributing black anger to the call for black power is ridiculous, if not obscene. And to quote James Baldwin, to be a Negro in this country and to be relatively conscious is to be enraged almost all the time. So it's it's you really need to um redefine racism if you're if you find black power to be a racist um um imperative so um and he also um it's the same thing with um Audre Lord who um critiqued um this the I think therefore I am um message and um, Cone says, I rebel, therefore we exist. So it's talking about how it's looking, making you look at rebellion and um, revolutionary violence through a different, through the lens that the mainstream media doesn't um, give you. So, yeah, so because violence get apparently in America, violence gets attention, like whether it's the Civil War, whether that's um race riots whether that's um the um the the riots that happen after um a, a black person gets murdered by police or something like that that it gets the attention like the city is hurting the city is upset about an injustice that's done to somebody in their community and it's not just um people stealing and looting and all that stuff like it it like those are micro um experiences, but looking at the bigger picture, it talks about how a community is upset about a thing that doesn't ha that didn't need to happen, and um, yeah, I think he will he was he would look at the George Floyd protest as as like something like that's something that always happens and you ha y'all have to do do a reckoning within yourselves to um make sure conditions are set in place for other people to not get killed by police 
whether that's through defund police, whether that's abolition, prison abolition, or something like that, and put that towards people that um, need food security, whether that they need um, health care security or job security or anything else that will alleviate, the, get provide them relief and um, and um, safety, and uh, he also. Yeah, just what I said. He said that um, black racism is a myth created by whites to ease their guilt feelings. So when white people say well, that's racist what, toward a black person or something, it's like like white people are so interesting. They, if they get called out about their racism, they will be saying like, you're racist for calling me racist or something like that. And um, it's it's... It shows you like the type of the type of power that they that they have, and um, like they don't even re they don't even recognize like how their existence um, is um, of is pretty much anti black in itself because of the resources you have, um, the different treatment you get compared to a black person. Um, it the the affirmation you get as a white person because of white supremacy. So it's, it's, um, so saying, telling a black person of, um, that they're racist, it's pretty much deflecting accountability on what are they doing to, um, uh, to, um, take responsibility for the damage that, that the people before them caused in, um, in, um, Specifically, the United States, but um, and colonialism in general. But um, yeah, Cohn says modern racism is European in origin, and America has been in its vigorous offspring. It is a white man who has sought to dehumanize others because of his feelings of superiority or for his economic advantage. Racism is so embedded in this country that it is hard to imagine that any white man can escape it. Yeah, because it requires like a lot of unlearning as a white person, like the the things that you've been told from your family or something, whether it's the cultural um, aspect of it, like that's how bad um, modern modern racism has got to it and got to this degree. And um, he also um, critiqued um, integration and how it's not progress. Um, let me see if I could, if I find a quote. Yeah, he's, Cone said, integration as commonly understood is nothing but a subterfuge for white supremacy. As always involving only a token number of Negroes integrated into white institutions are the white man's terms. As Professor Poussin shows, this means blacks accepting the white man's view of himself. Blacks saying, yes, we are inferior. So it... As, the as, the seat in the table um metaphor isn't as cute as 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 um cone as cone thinks it is that's pretty much what it is like okay you are invited in this white space but um how are the power dynamics in that space who's in control of the agenda who's in control of the curriculum who's in control of um what mm, mm, who gives the okay in um in a project and that excuse me that tends to be white massa <laughs> the oppressor and um and um that's not progress that's pretty much not progress even if you're a, a black person in a high leadership role it's you could still promote um an anti-black um pedagogy um through the through um because of the position itself like literally the president of the united states like just because one black person is there does not get rid of the anti-blackness that is the united states and um and it's you know black people are still dying so it's so it gives you a new um uh, more hol holistic per perspective on how integration um, is really doing in, um, society, and, um, and, um, 
Yeah, he said um, how black people, even in leadership roles, there's still some anti-blackness that needs to be unpacked, whether that's um, colorism or some or um, um, self hatred. Yeah, he said any careful assessment of the place of the black man in America must conclude that black self hatred is the worst aspect of the legacy of slavery. The the worst crime the white man has committed, writes Malcolm X, has been to teach us to hate ourselves. During slavery, black people were treated as animals and were systematically taught that such treatment was due them because of their blackness. When slavery was abolished, the Negro has been stripped of his culture and left with this heritage, an oppressed black man in a white man's world. Because because of what slavery did to people like like me, I'm a descendant of... um of um people that went through um American shadow slavery and I don't know what part of Africa um my bloodline is tied to but um that's literally because of the violence that slavery did to um did to uh, my ancestors so um I think that is a a tough uh, that is something to um um navigate and when blacks were rewarded, rewarded, it was because they behaved according to the stereotypes devised by whites. So black people are in these spaces because of um, white people's standards. And coupled with um, this was the belief that white is right and black is evil. Therefore, lighter Negroes were given better opportunities while darker Negroes had doors closed to them, giving credits to the idea that the closer you are to being white, the more clearly human you are. Unfortunately, even many of our black institutions and media promoted the idea. Like thinking about a lot of um, representations, especially in black media, it tends to be light skinned people that get um, more representation. Whether that's um, the sitcoms we we watched, at, the sitcoms that we watch, who gets who tends to get treated better than other black people and it tends to be the light light skinned um black people that tends to have um uh, more dimensions in their character more they get opportunities to be more complex more human than dark skinned characters so um yeah it, yeah 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 John Cohn says as Elijah Muhammad the leader of the black muslim rightly says the negro wants to be a white man he processes his hair acts like a white man he wants to integrate with the white man but he cannot integrate with himself or his own mind the negro wants to lose his identity because he does not know his own identity and there's so many things that come with that and yeah that's it for that and um and what, what Cone says is that we need affirmation and freedom, not integration and equality. So e equality and equity, those are cute for being in this um, being in this sort of space. But um, what we need is that people people to take care of their communities. People need their needs met. And equality and equity are just cute buzzwords for um, corporations to look um, like they actually care about you. And... Um, the next part is um, um, it's titled, Is There an Appropriate Response to White Racism? And Cohn says, It is time for whites to realize that the oppressor is in no position, whatever, to define a proper response to enslavement. So, yeah, white people need to... Um, so, white people can't have black people cater to their white feelings, literally. Because um, if we worry about white people, we're we're not caring for ourselves. So that is literally what I said with um, Sister Outsider and other um, literature in which um, if you focus on educating um, white people and it, and they're receptive to, um, um, to a certain tone, a certain um, way of things, whether, whether that's, um, it's you have to be kind to them or something like that. Like y'all are literally killing, killing my community. I have no time to be nice to you. And, um, that's, um, it's, it's like that logic is like, read the room. That's pretty much what Cone was saying. And, um, 
he had a critique of white liberals and accountability for their whiteness and pretty much said white people are responsible for their whiteness. And, um, yeah, he said, um, the real menace and in white intellectual arrogance is the dangerous assumption that the structure that enslaves is the structure that will also decide when and how this slavery is to be abolished. Like, I, we can't wait for, um, um, elites to tell us what the issue how we should focus on issues is really up to people and community and the masses to um hold them accountable and do whatever means necessary to um care for themselves and for each other and you can't give that power to people that are gonna are benefiting from your exploitation and um he said that black power gives a sense of hope and um, um, gives power to truth. And yeah, that's the, it gives truth to honesty. It gives truth to pan transparency and uh, anti-corruption. And um, Cohn says, depending on the response of whites, it means that emancipation may even have to take the form of outright rebellion. No one can really say what form the oppressed must take in relie relieving their oppression. But if blacks are pushed to the point of unendurable pain with no option but a violent affirmation of their own being, that violence is to be expected. The violence is to be expected. Violence is a personal necessity for the oppressed, writes John Rayleigh. And Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. says, riot is a language of the unheard. So, um... And it also goes to Huey P. Newman's revolutionary violence. Like you, like, like violence does doesn't have to be viewed as there. There shouldn't be a, a, a negative connotation to violence all the time. Like whether it's um, um, fighting an abuser or something like that. Like it, like do whatever it takes to get give get to get a uh, protection from harm. And. Um, mm -hmm. That was, yeah, that was pretty much it, I think. Yeah, and and the next part was titled, How Does Black Power Relate to White Guilt? And Cone says, White America's attempt to free itself from responsibility for the black man's inhuman condition is nothing but a protective device to ease their guilt. So it's pretty much telling white people to hold themselves accountable and do the research within themselves because there's so many resources. Like there's so many texts that um, black figures um, said what needs to be done about white supremacy and white people have to take it within themselves to do the research and practice the um, the theories and the, and the models and the study to... Um, contribute to the liberation of oppressed people because this is the this is something that they have to be held to, to held their feet to the fire to and um cone also said a man is free when he can determine the style of his existence in an absurd world so for black people a man is free when he sees himself for what he is and not as others define him he is free when he determines the limits of his existence Black people now know that freedom is not a gift from white society, but is rather the self-affirmation of one's existence as a person. A person with certain innate rights to say no and yes, despite the consequences. So and, and, and so being in a position, position of powerlessness, it's up to yourself to know that there is power within yourself and you have to um, you have to mobilize and create action to um, create the power that you deserve. And um, just because you don't have power doesn't mean you can't get power. And um, Cohn also said, to be sure, they may be the minority in the Black community, but truth, despite democracy, can never be measured by numbers. Truth is, is that which places a man in touch with the real. And once a man finds it, he is prepared to give all for it. The rebellion in the cities, then, is not a con conscious, organized attempt of black people to take over. It is an attempt to say yes to truth and no to untruth even in death. The question then is not whether black people are prepared to die. The riots testified to that, but whenever whether whites are prepared to kill them. So it's pretty much talking about the importance of, ma of, of mass mobilization and gener generating consciousness within other people that are in the masses. 
and um and if if we're having these these discussions about police violence um from a certain segment of a population imagine what will happen if um more people contribute to the movement and um knowing that change is going to come and um the revolution will carry on and that's it for chapter one. So we're on to chapter two. Chapter two is titled The Gospel of Jesus, Black Pow Black People and Black Power. And he says like the there is this need and what what inspired him to write this book is to um that there needs to be a theology of that with a revolution lens. So there needs to be a theology that considers um the oppression that black people are experiencing right now. Cause it's cause because of um, oppression, it le it can lead you to despair. Give you a give you um it generates fear. It generates violence. It generates um um things that can get generate trauma, and um there needs to be a um and a way to reach other people is through theology. Whether it's the the church, whether in not gonna be the church and community um um engagement and um. Cone says that there needs to be a message going around to the masses that focuses on liberation and revolution and um, self-determination. So um, that's how he got it. That's pretty much how he came up with um, Black Liberation Theology. And let me see if I got a quote. Yeah, he said the present work seeks to be revolutionary in the sense that it attempts to bring to theology a special attitude permeated with black consciousness. It asks the question, what does the Christian gospel have to say to powerless black men whose existence is threatened daily by the insidious tentacles of white power? Is there a message from Christ to the countless number of blacks whose lives are smothered under white society? Unless theology can become ghetto theology, a theology that speaks to black people, the gospel message has no promise of life for the black man. It is a lifeless message. Unfortunately, even black theologians have more often than not merely accepted the problems defined by white theologians. Their treatment of Christianity has been shaped by the dominant ethos of the culture. There have been very few of any radical revolutionary approaches to the Christian gospel for oppressed, black, oppressed blacks. There is then a need for a theology whose sole purpose is to emancipate the gospel from its whiteness so that blacks may be capable of making an honest self-affirmation through Jesus Christ. So he's pretty much going into the historical um um the historical aspect of um Christianity in the United States because um Christianity has been used to justify slavery it was used to justify all, a lot of systems of oppression and um if you really get into the book like Jesus was a revolutionary him, himself so it's like how do we get how do we get to here so um he He's prim he's emphasizing that and centering um Jesus the way Jesus carries throughout the world as um as a social justice um practice. So um and um he said that Jesus is representative as a gospel for the poor and an opp and the oppressed because he was literally killed by the government because so it's like you ha you even have to challenge the government on what um what do what what um type of um intentions and motives do they have for the people and um and um let's see let me see if I got a quote yeah and he, yeah he said that the that God is with um the poor like you if you read the Bible it tells you how much you should care for the poor because the um the United States poverty is literally there's so many people in poverty like it's insane like I don't know what's the average what's the average American makes but they're in that position because of um capitalism and colonial um structures so um. We have to create the solution within ourselves and um and leave people from poverty. So um I think um Cohn was in the poor people help with the poor people's campaign. Like I know the poor people's campaign, they practice liberation theology. 
So that 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 message um helps generate um, um communities to um take care of one another because of um, the messaging they got from the from in the gospel of Christ. And um the and freedom it needs to be centered and practiced. So everyone needs to have freedom in mind. And um, Cone had this critique of theologians that do not uphold God's righteousness, which is to help the poor. And um, he like like I was surprised even back then. Like there are preacher like he critique he's literally critiquing billionaires, millionaires, and people that make that make a living out of um, out of the communities that supposedly serve. So like, why is a why is a pastor? Why do pra- pastors have yachts and stuff like that? While there's people people literally starving, there's people literally don't work trying trying to figure out what clothes they need, like what how do they what things they do they need to afford? How are they how are they gonna get a house and stuff like that? And um, Cone said, Christianity is not alien to black power. It is black power. Black rebellion is a manifestation of God himself actively involved in the present day affairs of men for the purpose of liberating a people. And he said, freedom is not doing what I will, but becoming what I should. So you need to do um, a consciousness within yourself on what freedom looks like and do what you have to do to make that freedom possible and um, create a future that benefits um, future generations and um, and he feels like not enough theologians are doing that and there needs to be freedom and justice for poor and the rich need to be held accountable and God doesn't censor the rich and the elites and um yeah, he said black power and Christian love are interconnected. So he sees the black power as even though it doesn't just even though there's a lot of polarization with when, when it comes to religion within black power, Cone sees black power as a practice of of Christianity because um it focuses on the needs of the of oppressed people. And um Let me see. Yeah, he said here, men are controlled by evil powers that will make them slaves. The demonic forces of racism are real for the black man. Theologically, Malcolm X was not far wrong when he called the white man the devil. The white structure of this American society personified in every racist must be at least part of what the New Testament meant by the demonic forces. According to the New Testament, these powers can get a hold hold of a man's total being and can control his life to such a degree that he is incapable of distinguishing himself from the alien power. This seems to be what has happened to the white to white racism in America. It is a part of the spirit of the age, the ethos of the culture, so embedded in a social, economic, and political structure that white society is incapable of knowing its destructive nature. There is only one response. Fight it. So yeah, there needs to be political education. There needs to be... Um, dialogue to um dismantle um white supremacy in all its form in all its shapes and forms and then he said um with reference then to freedom in christ three assertions about black power can be made first the work of christ is existentially a liberate liberating work directed toward and by the oppressed black power embraces that very task Second, Christ is liberating the wretched of the earth, also liberates those responsible for the wretchedness. The oppressor is also freed of his peculiar demons. The black power is shouting yes to black humanness and no to white oppression, is is exercising demons on, exorcising demons on both sides of the conflict. Third, mature freedom is burdensome and risky, producing anxiety and conflict for free men and for the brittle structures they challenge. The call for black power is precisely the call to shoulder the burden of liberty in Christ, risking everything to live not as slaves, but as free men. So, so focusing on the lens of, um, be, uh, fo- of um, freedom you have to do the work and that work is going to be tough there's going to be struggle there's going to be 
um, ex exhaustion and burnout from the work because of the things that capitalism and white supremacy um, put on oppressed people. And um, you just have to do the work within yourself and work with others to um, get the empowerment you need. And whatever God does must be just because he is justice. And amen to that. And let me see, is there anything else that I highlighted? Yeah, he said um, you can identify the Holy Spirit when um, man, when, when people are involved and willing to die for change. So um, think about the Holy Spirit when you when you go to church like there's like some people um dance to the holy to the holy spirit and stuff like that and um looking at it in uh activism and an organizing um perspective that can that can look like um feeding people giving people food it can be um practicing self care it can be um it, it it literally um like I think Asia Marie Brown says it best on pleasure activism on what gives you pleasure and that pleasure can be the whole and the Holy Spirit and the pleasure can be something that's connected and and like taking care of people it can make you feel good and that can be the Holy Spirit uh, making you feel that pleasure and. Um, Cohn says no Christian can evade this responsibility. He cannot say that the poor are in poverty because they will not work or they suffer because they are lazy. Having come be before God has nothing and being received by him into his kingdom through grace. The Christian should know that he has been made righteous, justified, so that he can join God in the fight for justice. Therefore, whoever fights for the poor fights for God. Whoever risks his life for the helpless and unwanted risks his life for God. God is active now in the lives of those men who feel an absolute identification with all who suffer because there is no justice in the land. So it's not Christian to be classes. It's not Christian to have this judgment toward poor people. It's um, Christian to have the poor and to help the poor um, get their needs met and um getting the care that they deserve because they shouldn't have to live in a, in a society that where poverty exists. It's like no one should be in poverty. And um, Cohen also said, but this is the never ending task of theology in the church. The real temptation is to identify our own interests with God's and thus say that he is active in those activities that best serve our, pur our purposes. So... Is there anything else? Y'all said because of God's act of love to man, man can now have fellowship with him. And, uh, ooh, he also got a good definition on what love means. Like Bell Hooks, um, all about love. I'm thinking he has his definition of love. He said, love means that God rights the wrongs of humanity because they are inconsistent with his purpose for man. Righteousness means that God cannot turn his back on evil, that he cannot pretend that wrong is right. Love means that he acts for man's own best interest, that man's welfare is God's primary concern, and so does righteousness. And he quoted uh, Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 through 40, which says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. And um, yeah, so you, so if you, if you, if you get away from what society's definition of love is and have this perspective on love, you're actually practicing Christ. You're actually should be practicing um justice freedom and liberation and um dismantling of oppression and um because because capitalism promotes all this um put yourself up by the bootstraps individualism and if you work hard enough you make it and not in pretty much negating the fact that people can literally help you there can be collectivism and community and um and um um, interdependency for not just for 
freedom, but literally for survival. So that's that's what he said there. And Cohn also said, for God to love the black man means that God has made him somebody. The black man does not need to hate himself because he is not white and he should feel no need to become like others. His blackness, which society despises, is a special creation of God himself. He has worth because God imparts value through loving. It means that God has bestowed on him a new image of himself so that he can now become what he in fact is. Through God's love, the black man is given the power to become, the power to make others recognize him. Because God is a God of power, of majesty, and of might. To love man means that he wills that the black man, reflecting the immediacies, immediacies of his life, his power, his majesty, and his might. So talk about the importance of self-love, and you can and you can have self-love in a theological sense. Like you you had no choice to have being black. So it's it's important to love all those um aspects of yourself. Like you're gonna be black until you die. Like if you're not loving yourself, you're not giving yourself the chance to actually live. And um and um Cone had this um what what are the relationships that black people and white people should have in a theological sense? And Cone says, but what does it mean for the black man to love the love the neighbor, especially the white neighbor? To love the white man means that the black man confronts him as a thou without any attentions of giving around by becoming an it. Though the white man is accustomed to addressing to an it, in the new black man, he means a thou. So there needs to be a recognize, recognition of black humanity because of what white supremacy does. And the black man must, if he is not to lose sight of his newfound identity in Christ, be prepared for conflict, for a radical confrontation. As one black man put it, profound love can only exist between two equals. The new black man refuses to assume the it role which whites expect, but addresses them as an equal. This is when the conflict arises. So there needs to be some challenges literally because of what white supremacy sets up in order to practice liberation you need to be you need to challenge people and people and how people act will challenge you and um you can't lose your and you can't lose yourself through that challenge and um Cone also said um about love and power both love and power must be interrelated Power becomes the possibility of the reunion of self with self and with the other. Without power, love would cease to the lo be love because reunion would be impossible and being would become non-being. And love conflicts with compulsory power only when it prevents the aim of love, namely the reunion of the separated. So he's pretty much um, going through an anti-capitalist um, message here which is the compulsory power. Like there needs to be someone, uh, there needs to be a leader. And it's like, people can, it's like people can't lead themselves. They, But the people know what they're going through. They know if they have the education, the resources, they can do anything and they can lead their own lives. So it's not putting um, power, giving voice to a messiah, which is... Um, which is um, a lot of um, what the civil rights movement went through, but it took people to um, uh, mobilize and create action to get to um, challenge um, systemic structures. And um, he also said that, um, let me see. It seems that whites forget about the necessary interrelatedness of love, justice, and power when they encounter black people. Love becomes emotional and sentimental. This is sentimental. Condescending love accounts for their desire to help by relieving the physical pains of the suffering blacks so they can satisfy their own religious piety and keep the poor powerless. But the new blacks, redeemed in Christ, must refuse their help and demand that blacks be confronted as persons. They must say to white to whites that authentic love is not help, not giving Christmas baskets, but working for political, social, and economic justice, which always means a redistribution of power. It is a kind of power that enables the blacks to fight their own battles and thus keep their dignity. Powerlessness needs a race of beggars. So it's 
cute for a, a for um, Black Lives Matter chapters to get the donations from like a celebrity or something, but there needs to be a redistribution of needs. Like there needs to be a redistribution of resources, whether it's food, money, houses, and etc. And um, Cohen also said, Christian love comprises the being of a man whereby he behaves as if God is the essence of his existence. It means that God has hold of him and his movement in the world. And Cohn also said about um, the violence in the cities, which appears to contradict Christian love is nothing but the black man's attempt to say yes to his being as defined by God and the world that would make his being into non-being. If the riots are the black man's courage to say yes to himself as a creature of God and in affirming a self, he affirms yes to the neighbor, then violence may be the black man's expression, sometimes the only possible expression, a Christian love to the white oppressor. So imagine um, preachers telling Nat Turner, that's not how you get freedom when when he was doing the, the slave revolt. Imagine this that type of messaging um um being centered and uh it's it's not giving you a vision of what true justice actually looks like and uh we can't just cater to the feelings of um the elites and the white power structure we have to they literally have to go they're doing us no service they're literally are the ones that are making us suffer and Cohn also said, it seems that the mistake of most whites, reli whites, religionists included, is their insistence on telling blacks how to respond as Christians to racism, insisting that nonviolence is the only appropriate response. But there is an ugly contrast between the sweet nonviolent language of white Christians and their participation in a violently unjust system. Maybe the oppressor's being is so warped by his own view of himself that every analysis made by him merely reveals his own inflated self-evaluation. Certainly as long as he can count on blacks remaining nonviolent by turning the other cheek and accepting the conditions of slavery, there will be no real pressure to confront the black man as a person. If he can be, show, be sure that blacks will not threaten his wealth, his superiority, his power in the world, there will be no need to give up his control of the black man's destiny. So thinking about how um, Martin Luther King Jr. is sanitized, white people love I Have a Dream, but they they don't recognize his um, anti-war um, stances, his anti-poor um, stances, and his anti-capitalist um, stances. So they only recognize um, the color of your skin, the constants of a character, but not understanding the implications on how the system made the made that made that a concern so um let's see uh, what else did i highlight here all right i'm almost done <laughs> okay so um cone also said um Authentic living according to the spirit means that one's will becomes God's will. One's actions becomes God's action. It could be that many will be excluded because their motives are ill-founded. And this may mean that God is not necessarily at work in those places where the word is truly preached and the sacraments are duly administered. But where the naked are clothed, the sick are visited, and the hungry are fed. So pretty much what kind of discussions had to happen in organizing and activism um, actions and circles? What are people's true intentions in doing liberating work? Is it just to make them look good or is it to actually um, help people and help them um, live in an anti-black world that where they need their needs met? And um, Cone said um, here, black power then is God's way, new way of acting in America it is his way of saying to blacks that they are human beings. He is saying to whites, get used to it. All right. So um, let me see. I'm probably going to go through chapter three and that'll be it for this video. So um, the next chapter is titled The White Church and Black Power, which is pretty juicy. Um, he was talking about the role of the general American church 
and God's concern for the powerless. And um, he's t pretty much critiquing um, how white preachers are quiet um, when black people are suffering. Like you're literally not going to do the work of God <laughs> if you're you're being silent about black issues. Because there, because there, there's a lot of white white even because in the United States is it's a lot of white evangelicals um, here. There are televangelists, like there are literally there are literally um, ministers that are millionaires and billionaires and literally screwing um, poor people over and um, not me not getting their needs and not and not um, having a collective um, politic. And um, he was pretty much talking about what is the church. Like, talk about the history of, like, how religion um, got into, um, has been used as um, propaganda for, for um, colonialism and white supremacy. And how it, it's also fed these messages about individualism and capitalist um, ideals. And he was talking about... Um, the curse of Ham, which is um, if, if you know that um story of the Bible where Ham is mostly dark skin, so it's so it's like taken, it's like it was interpreted as like a curse. So that's how um, that's how it got to the point where treating black people as slaves, literally creating a system to make black people slaves, and contributing to the enslavement of the United States. And um, and is literally contradicting the fact that the church is God's suffering people. It's supposed to be censoring the the um, the people that are powerless. And Cone um quoted um um a theologian named I forgot his full name. The last name is Bonhoeffer. And um, he quoted, um, to be a Christian does not mean to be religious in a particular way, to cultivate some particular form of asceticism, asceticism, but to be a man. It is not some religious act which makes a Christian that he is, but a participation in the suffering of God in the life of the world. Um, and um, he's talking, pretty much talking about how it was... Um, like you don't have to identify as a Christian to practice um Christian um principles, whether that's um treat others with um respect and um care for one another and love thy neighbor and stuff like that. You can literally just practice it and not identify as a Christian. So it's giving room that someone like atheists and agnostics, they can practice um stuff that good things that Christianity um, promotes. And um, Cohn also said, it is important to remember that the preaching of the world word presents a crisis situation. The hearing of the news of freedom through the preaching of the word always invites the hearer to take one of two sides. He must either side with the old rulers or the new one. He that is not for me is against me. There is no neutral position in a war. Even in silence, one is automatically identified as being on the side of the oppressor. There is no place in this war of liberation for nice white people who want to avoid taking sides and remain friends with both the racist and the Negro. So he was pretty much t um, critiquing uh, white liberals and white moderates who um, tried to see both sides, tried to understand everyone's point of view, even when that point of view is inherently violent and and pretty much this message that if you're silent about oppression, you're taking the side of the oppressor. Like you're just you're just gonna stand there and let the oppressor have a power to destroy me, and um, that's not gonna get us to any um, democ democracy that um, that white American white liberals wanted. And um, Cohn also said, where is the opening that Christ provides? Where does he lead his people? Where indeed, if not in the ghetto, he meets the blacks where they are and becomes one of them. We see him there with his black face and big black hands lounging on a street corner. Um, but society is not raceless any more than when God became a despised Jew. 
when liberal preference for a raceless Christ serves only to make official and orthodox the centuries-old portrayal of a Christ as white, the raceless American Christ has a light skin, wavy brown hair, and sometimes wonder of wonders, blue eyes. For whites to find him with big lips and kinky hair is as offensive as it was for the Pharisees to find him partying with tax collectors. But whether whites want to hear it or not, Christ is black, baby, with all of the features that are so detestable to white society. So and we know the imagery of Jesus. It's usually a white man, blonde or of uh, brunette hair. But if actually, if he 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 would identify as as brown skin or or black, and um. And um, Cone said, thinking of Christ as non-black in the 20th century is as theologically impossible as thinking of him as non-Jewish in the first century. So he was pretty much talking about how white supremacy um, really took control of religion in the United States to the degree where it is literally detached to Christian theology, truth Christian theology that was, that was um, known before colonialism. And he was talking about how the white church is anti-poor and um, whites, and um, the white church historically has supported slavery. Um, and I didn't know this, like there was a point where there were black people in the North where, because the, because slavery wasn't happening in the North, but racism is still prevalent in the North. But um, there were black people, black people were invited, were allowed to go into white churches, but they were, quote unquote, supervised. They still had to um, confide to white standards and white ways of white ways of living. Like whiteness is still functioning in, um, in the white churches, specifically in the north. So it dispels the myth that racism is only in the south. And um and there is a, and um, they were quiet about lynching. Um, the white church enabled the KKK revival. Um, there was a history of, um, and talking about the North versus the South, like they said the Civil War and Civil Rights was only a Southern problem, when in real reality, Dr. King literally says like Chicago literally has he sees more anti-blackness in chicago than in like mississippi and um yeah and cohen also said um the white church's morals are so immoral that even its most sensitive minds are unable to detect the inhumanity of the church on the black people of america so it's literally you can't get liberation by going into those spaces. And um he also said the white church has not merely failed to render services to the poor, but has failed miserably in being a visible manifestation to the world of God's intention for humanity and in proclaiming the gospel to the world. It seems that the white church is not God's redemptive agent, but rather an agent of the old society. It fails to create an atmosphere of radical obedience to Christ. Most church fellowships are more concerned about drinking or new buildings or Sunday closing than about children who die of rat bites or men who are killed because they want to be treated like men. The society is falling apart for once a moral leadership and moral example, but the white church passes innocuously pious resolutions and ways to be congratulated. So he said the true church of Christ must define clearly through its members, the meaning of God's act in Christ so that all may know what the church is up to. So it gives, it's like a reality check on um, what the white church is and what it's about and how it literally enables whites, literally enables antichrist by, by having this image of Christ. And, um, and um, Cohn also said, is the enemy of Christ, it was the white Christian church that took the lead in establishing slavery as an institution, segregation as a pattern in society by sanctioning all white congregations, because there was all white congregations with um, no colors for color, no colors allowed. And um, 
Um, Cohen also said, many writers have shown the Christ, the church's vested interest in slavery and racism in America. And once you go read this, you'll be like, wow, they're literally, um, you really have to listen and have critical thinking um, skills to see what are people's intentions with religion, especially Christianity. And... Um, He is also talking about how theology has become part of American patriotism when American patriotism um, tends to suppress um, being quiet about anti-Black racism. And there's these Eurocentric and Western privileges. And um, there needs to be... Um, uh, theologians have a lot of work to do. And with um, what to do about the church nowadays. And um, yeah, Cohn said the church should speak in a style that avoids abstractions. Its language must be backed up with relevant involvement in the affairs of people who suffer. It must be a grouping whose community life and personal involvement are coherent with its language about the gospel. And that's literally the same as like academia. Like it's cute to have all these theories. It's cute to have all these messages. It's cute to have the, to preach but if there's no practice, if there's no action, if there's no um, substance in the details, like your me your message is meaningless and can lead to harm and violence too. So that's what Cone was getting at. And um, he also said, this allows the irresponsible religious man to grasp a false kind of religious and political security by equating law and order with Christian morality. So he's saying Christ, you can't find Christ within um, whatever the laws are and what um, the state says. You have to do it within your own research. You have to do it within your own work. You have to do your own um, um, cons conscious work, your own outreach to others and um find um liberation freedom through that and um let me see how much room all right i'm almost done yeah cone also said it was seen that it is time for theology to make a radical break with its identity with the world by seeking to bring to the problem problem of color the revolutionary implications of the gospel of christ it is time for theology to leave its ivory tower and join the real issues which deal with dehumanization of blacks in america it is time for theologians to relate their work to life and death issues and in doing in so doing to execute its function of bringing the church to a recognition of its task in the world so there needs to be some some concrete connections between the world issues which is are the antichrist which is racism classism um and systems of oppression and um there needs to be practice from the messaging from the theology because theology is going to be here forever and there's a history of theology that predates um slavery and um people have to make these connections and find Christ within themselves and their work. And um, let me see, is there anything else that I highlighted? Yep. So in this situation of revolution and reaction, the church must decide where its identity lies. Will it continue its chaplaincy to the forces of oppression or will it embrace the cause of liberation, proclaiming and word and deep the gospel of Christ? So when the revolution comes, we'll know the answer. But um, think of, is there room for Christianity when it comes to liberation? And Cones think, argues that there is place for Christianity because Jesus was a radical and a revolutionary himself. So um, we have to live, we, have, we can live like Christ, literally. So, and I think that's it for this video. So stay tuned for part two. Um, make sure y'all follow my, my personal Instagram at intellectual Albert and my reading list at raising souls. Um, I'll provide on the description box below and, um, thank you. Um, stay tuned for part two. Um, and we will talk about chapters four, five, 
six, and seven. All right. See y'all.